John Palmer, the author of How to Brew, joins me to discuss beer recipe design. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 188. This is Beer Smith Podcast number 188, and it's late February 2019. John Palmer joins me this week to discuss beer recipe design. Thank you to this week's sponsor is Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Get your, get your offer today at beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also the Riptide Pump from Blickman Engineering. Designed for home brewers, this pump features a whisper quiet sealed housing, a removable tri-clamp stainless steel head that's easy to clean, and a built-in relief valve for easy priming. It also has the integral Blickman linear valve for precise flow control. Get the Riptide Pump today. Another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith 3 is available now for download and also the mobile version's out. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider recipe support to the Beersmith platform, along with new water and, and, and pH tools. Dozens of new features, including cloud folders, updated databases, support for juice, honey, as well as new Whirlpool hop options. Download your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com and give it a try. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back John Palmer. John is the author of the top-selling homebrew book in the world called How to Brew, as well as a definitive book on brewing water and brewing classic styles. Today, he joins us to talk about beer recipe design. John, it's uh, always a pleasure to have you on the show. How are you doing, Brad? Good to see you again. I'm doing great, man. What have you been, uh, what have you been up to the last few months? You've been doing some traveling? No, not lately. It's uh, mostly been working on uh, editing MBAA articles, you know, Master Brewers Association, and um, working on my presentation for the BYO Boot Camp coming up next month. Um, be doing a water class and an all grain class there with uh, John Blickman. Yeah, and, I'm, I'm uh, doing a designing beer class there. That's right. That's I think right. John John's going to take us fishing too. He says, right? That'll be good. I haven't <laughs> done that in a while, and uh, you know. Can't pass up chance to go fishing, that's for sure. Nope, nope. Um, well, today you want to talk about beer recipe design, which happens to also be the topic I'm talking about at the BYO Boot Camp you just mentioned. But um, let's yeah. uh, let's let's talk a little bit about that. Where do you how do you how do you start sort of from scratch if you're trying to design a new beer recipe? Well, for me, I think I think of beer recipes in terms of sandwich recipes, really, and it, it, it's it's an analogy that helps because you want to think in terms of proportions, you know, nine, 70 to 90% of a beer recipe is the base malt. And so if you think about that in terms of a sandwich, you know, 90% of a sandwich is the bread. Um, then you add, you know, signature, uh, flavors such as peanut butter or roast beef or turkey or what have you. And then you add on some, uh, accents, you know, some seasonings, some specialty malts in our case of, with beers. Um, but, you know, in, a, in other way, in this sense, you build a, you know, a sum that's greater than the, the uh, sorry, a whole that's greater than the sum of the parts, uh, something that builds on itself. You have the base malt, you have some signature malts, specialty malts, and then you have some accent specialty malts. And then with the hops and yeast character and water character on top of all that. So are there any uh, good guidelines for determining the right mix of grains to use to, to maybe achieve a given flavor profile? Well, yeah. I mean, um, I guess, you know, looking at specialty malts, we have several different kinds. Um, we have the uh, high kiln malts or amber malts, as they're called. These often have a a bread crust to cookie to, you know, uh, to very toasty flavors. And those can, those can add some, you know, dry malt character to the, to the beer. Uh, then you have your crystal malts and those um, have anywhere from like a honey like character to uh, caramel to marshmallow, burnt marshmallow uh, 
roasted sugar kind of character. Uh, and then you have your roast malts, your high color malts, um, and those have characters of like chocolate, cocoa, and coffee. Um, and so between all these three malt types so in, in your base malt, you have kind of a three-dimensional malt space. You have your base malt, which can be anywhere from the very white bread Pilsner malt, a very, very um, light grain flavor, to a little warmer flavor, a sweeter bread, and to a dark bread like a Munich malt. So you have that scale. And then you have the uh, toasty scale, and then you have the, the caramel malts, the sweetness, that that range, and then you have your roast malts filling out a third dimension. So you can kind of visualize how all these different flavors come together when you're designing your recipe. And is there an advantage to uh, using malts that are maybe very different in flavor? Do you get uh, is that is that how you get sort of the depth, or or or, or do you prefer to use ones that are similar? I, I'm yeah. I it, I tend to think in terms of um, triangles or pyramids or so on, you know, geometric figures. So, you know, my base malt will be my starting point, and then I'll add a, a sweetness dimension. And then maybe I'll add a toastiness dimension and a, a roast dimension on top of that as well as I'm trying to visualize all this. Um, but you can't have complexity. And we're, I, I think we're kind of talking about, you know, how to build in complexity to a recipe. You can't have complexity without balance. And I think if you if we go back to the sandwich analogy, you know, you can't make – uh, a good sandwich by, you know, assembling your bread and your meat and your cheese and then dumping half a pot of mustard on top of it. All you're going to taste is mustard. And, you know, so that overwhelms the composite. Um, the same way when you're talking about different specialty malts and proportions, you don't want um, a particular signature malt or a specialty malt to overwhelm the composition. So, uh, in terms of recipe proportions in malts, um, I think of 70 to 90% of your recipe should be your base malt. Um, another 10 to 20% can be a signature malt, such as, you know, roast malt for stouts, um, chocolate malt for porters, um, caramel malts for ambers and box, you know, these various signature flavors that you associate with style, that specialty malt can be 10 to 20% of the grain bill. And then when you look at, you know, accents, do you want that that um, say chocolate malt to have a little bit of sweetness as well. Then you look to a caramel malt at a five to ten percent um, per weight percent proportion to add that accent. Um, and so you get you want to keep these things in in proportion. Um, if you look at commercial beer recipes, usually there are three malts or less. Rarely do they go to like five malts. In the home brewing scene, we're all, you know, we have so many malts available to us and there's so much, you know, creativity available that um, it's very easy to have a five, seven, nine malt grain bill. But the problem is that tends to become overcomplicated. Big flavors get a little bit muddled and you lose complexity. Uh, you just made mud. So uh, keep things in balance. Um, if you're thinking in terms of trying to add special malts to gain complexity, keep those percentages small, keep it balanced. So I, yeah, you're talking about like the everything but the kitchen sink type problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. People Very throw in everything. To do. Yeah. I, yeah. I do it as well. <laughs> I mean, maybe appropriate for something like a porter, but in a lot of cases, it, as you pointed out, it really muddles the beer. Yeah. I mean, it's surprising when you do, you know, you go to, go to your local craft brewery and start talking with the, the brewers. Um, some of your favorite beer recipes, even if they are a, a porter or a stout, generally have three, maybe four malts. Um, you know, rarely do you find more. 
And then, you know, other things, you know, people are always amazed to find out like a traditional IPA is really just made with pale malt, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's simplicity um, it, as is key. I mean, um, and, you know, the old saying, keep it simple, stupid, you know, uh, it really does apply because so much of your beer character comes from the fermentation, comes from the yeast and how you ferment that beer. It's not just the grain bill and not just the hop bill. It is, you know, the whole. Um, are you familiar with Randy Mosher's concept about harsh zone malts? Uh, sort of this, you know, idea. Yeah. Can you talk to talk to that for a minute? Because that's that's been an important concept that 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 that's helped me a lot the last few years. Yeah, yeah. Um, what we're talking about is as you increase the color of a specialty malt, um, this is done by roasting, kilning, and roasting. And so and when you when you take a, a base malt and you start roasting it or kilning, I should say, raising the temperature and generating color, you go through a transition from um, toasty notes to darker bread crust notes um, to cookie and so on. As you get towards the, the red to brown range, you go through a transition. This is like three temperatures of 325 to about 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, or let's, I think it's like, it's about, eight, it's, it's about 80 Lubbock, I think is where it starts sort of. Right. Yeah. And especially, but especially as you get, um, above like 150 to 180, I think the 200, the, you, you need a maltster needs to do this range. Right. I mean, because it is easy to generate harsh flavors. Um, when you get to around 200 Lobobon to 250, I think that's like the prime harsh area where you've you've started actually pyrolyzing, you know, burning different compounds in the malt, um, and you know, volatiles are starting to come off, and you can notice that in brown malt. Um, you can also notice it in pale chocolate. Uh, pale chocolate's just on the other side of that range. Yeah, a lot of people where, a lot of people don't realize that pale chocolate malt is much harsher than regular chocolate malt. Oh right? yeah, yeah, a little bit goes a long way, at least for my my uh, taste. Another um, one is uh, Special B. I think is in that kind of in that harsh range. Yeah, it is Special B. You're like a 180. Uh, I think a little bond somewhere up there, and. Uh, I made that wrong, but yeah, it's right. It's right up there. Special be you're into that toasted sugar, toasted marshmallow, uh, and it can be harsh in, in large amounts. Same with the pale chocolate. I mean, you're coming up from the other side, but a little bit, uh, a, too much can have a very dry, lingering uh, harshness. Um, most chocolate malts are sold at around a 300, 350 Lova Bond kind of range where you're getting these uh, cocoa and dark chocolate type flavors, no sweetness, of course, but just that cocoa dark chocolate. Um, I find like a 400 Lovobon chocolate has cleaner flavors for my palate. So I, I like the like the dark chocolate malts, like closer to 400. Um, and then as you go into, you know, your ro your black malts, your black patent, roast barley, those are up around 500 Lova Bond. Um, and you, you're starting to run into the top end of stringency or acridness there where um, those malts can also have uh, some harsh flavors and do, use too much of them. But those are uh, those have more of a roasted flavor as opposed to some of the yeah. harsh, you know, burnt marshmallow flavors you might get in the in the mid range, right? Right. Yeah. yeah. Your roast malts, black patent, roast barley. Um, yeah, it's it's like a, a dark coffee, um, too strong a coffee harshness that you can get from too much of those. Um, but I mean, yeah, if you're using right, something like that's right in the middle of the range, like special B, you got to be really careful. You're talking like a couple percent probably, right? Yeah. Yeah. Five percent max. Kind of thing, yeah. Uh, two and a half, I would say. Two and a half weight percent is probably a, a better uh, recommendate general recommendation. Yeah, yeah, it'd give you plenty of flavor without over overwhelming the beer, you know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and that, I think that's another 
key point here as we talk about recipe and grain build is, you know, so many of these uh, specialty malts are meant to be used in these small amounts to add accent, to add, you know, hints of flavor, not to dominate the flavor. And that, that's a very good point you make. Um, before we leave malts, how do you how do you sort of achieve um, a malt balance that's really greater than the sum of the parts? How do you how do you develop that? Yeah, I think it, I think it goes back to proportions. You know, you want to have the base malt has seventy to ninety percent of the of the recipe, then add that key signature malt at around a 10 percent uh, weight percent um, level, maybe up to twenty depending on style. And then maybe one or two accent malts at around the two and a half to five percent level, and and just keep those proportions in mind as your design recipe. Um, don't exceed those because then you start getting into that muddy region where you just got you know too much going on or too much of a a, a accent flavor taking over the flavor of the beer. Okay, well let's uh, let's move on to hops. Um, what are some of the guidelines for getting the hop balance right for a given beer style? Yeah, um, there's the the bitterness unit to gravity unit um, uh, ratio, and uh, this is something you have in Beersmith, and I have it in How to Brew. It comes from um, Ray Daniel's book, Designing Great Beers, and I think it's a really useful concept to you know kind of at least put some boundaries around um, the, the balance of malt flavor to hop flavor and malt character to hop character. Um, it's and then, of course, you, uh, you calculate that just by dividing the IBUs by the gravity points, which is the sort of your uh, original yeah, the, gravity without the one, right? That's right, yeah. So if you have a 1050 beer, that's 50 gravity points, 30 IBU, uh, then you're talking, you know. Um, Three fifths. Three fifths, yeah, thirty to fifty, and it's interesting when you look at beer styles, and if you look through the BJC style guidelines, and you kind of take the average of the ranges, most beers, say fifty fifty percent of the total beer styles, come out in that one half, one to two, two to four range um, of bitterness to gravity. So, you know, that and that's that's um, those are styles such as, um, oh, uh, Pilsner, Munich Helles, Pale Ale. Um, you know, a lot of our very common session beers will have that, you know, one to two type ratio. And there's, you know, a little wiggle room, like one and a half to two or, you know, 0.75 to two. But you get the idea. Um and so that that's a really good zone uh, if you're looking for a, a kind of a session beer, something that's not uh, too aggressive. Now, if you go to an IPA style, um, generally you're looking more in the three to four to four to four, a one to one kind of uh, bitterness to gravity. Um, a West Coast IPA, for example, 75 IBUs, 1075 gravity is not uh, is pretty common. And you can go over that too a little bit. Sometimes you'll see 90 IBUs to 1075 type gravity. When you start going to the double IPA or imperial IPA, that's when you're starting to get beyond that into kind of a, a five to four kind of ratio as opposed to four to four or three to four. Um, well, uh, what are some of the hop techniques that we might uh, use today? There's, there's quite a few now, right? Yeah, it's interesting. We've, we've really, I think, transitioned um, from what was the traditional homebrewing method of, you know, a bittering addition, a mid-boil addition, and then a end-of-boil addition, you know, um, so kind of 60-minute, 30-minute 10 minute kind of thing or 15 minute. Now we're kind of doing more than just the 60 minute boil and then really opting for late additions after the boil, after the heat's off, we will add um, some hops then because we're really trying to capture that hop oil and hop aroma in the beer. Um, our beers today are generally 
uh, hoppier than they ever have been in the past. I think even back, you know, in the in the heyday of uh, India Pale Ales, you know, seventeen eight and eighteen hundreds, um, I think we're probably hoppier today than we were then. Um, and so, um, yeah, bittering edition and then end of boil editions are kind of where we are at the moment. Um, I think another principle for brewers in recipe design is um, as a home brewer, it's so easy to add hops anywhere in the process uh, that you te we tend to over hop things. Um, not everything should taste like an IPA. So yeah. if you're making a – yeah. It's one of if my pet peeves porter, too. Yeah, yeah, me too. If you're if you're brewing a, a maltier style like a porter or a Munich Dunkel or a Bach or a, a Belgian double, you know, do that bittering addition, sixty minutes or even ninety minutes if you so desired. But get you know get that good clean balancing bitterness, and then maybe add a touch of hops after the boil. Just get a little bit of hop aroma, you know if you so desire. I mean, but don't think that every beer style should have hop aroma because it's not the case. Beer, our, our beer styles, um, you know, it's great to brew outside the box, but try that multi style. I think you'll like it. Munich Dunkel continues to be one of my absolute favorite beer styles. Uh, same with a uh, good porter. And it's where you let that malt character shine through and not overwhelm it with hops, uh, especially in the flavor department. Don't muddy up your malt flavors with hop flavors if, if that's not the style. So, my yeah, two even. cents. Even the complex, I, I enjoy a lot of English beers, and the complexity of the English beers just gets completely wiped out if you if you over hop it, you know. That's right. That's a very good point. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, have fun, but understand where the boxes are. Well, um, let's talk about hop flavor and aroma. What are some of the key aromas and flavors that we might get from some of the different varieties? Yeah, well, we've got um, more and more hop varieties these days than we ever have before, certainly. Um, you have, maybe just, think, yeah, maybe just pick a few examples. Um, yeah. Um, these days we have the what we call the Pacific hop varieties. Um, these are the fruitier hop varieties. Um, Mosaic is a great example, uh, even though it's it's more of a U.S. variety than a Pacific variety, but it has that bright tropical fruit kind of flavor uh, that our usual American varieties like citrus, um, Cascade, and Centennial uh, don't. Um, and so, um, you know, plant, when planning your beer recipe, um, think about the kind of hops you want to use, that the kind of hops that, you know, will, you know, offer some, some balance and, and so some counterpoints and complexity to the grain bill. Um, New England IPAs uh, is an example. Uh, these benefit from these uh, fruitier hop varieties, you know, these Pacific hop varieties. Uh, I think they offer those uh, juicier um, notes that, uh, whereas a, a hop like Simcoe with a you know, very distinct pine character uh, doesn't really work as well. Um, I, can you talk a little bit more about hop varieties? Obviously, there's uh, we we talk quite about a Pacific ones, but obviously there's uh, uh, you know continental, yeah. there's British, there's uh, traditional American, you know Pacific or Pacific Northwest, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, I, I, I when I think of hops, I think in terms of um, we have the British hop varieties, which tend to be kind of floral, earthy. You have the German hop varieties or European varieties, a um, little more floral, spicy uh, re, um, orientation. Um, the American, which tend to be citrus and pine. Uh, the Pacific, more tropical fruit, um, and as well as citrus. Um, so there, you know, there's four or five different groups that have these these strong uh, dominating characters, um, and of course, there's, there's beer styles associated with each of those, right? Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, it's it's kind of maddening when you go to the UK these days and you go to try a traditional English, English bitter um, and they hand you a glass and it's been brewed with Cascade. You know, it's kind of like, no, I want the English East Kent Goldings. You know, that's tr- that <laughs> Yeah, I want an English mild, right? Yeah, that you want that English character that you've that you've heard about, but um, hey, you know, um, brewers are the same the world over. We all want to experiment with each other's ingredients and try try new things. Um, so hey, can't blame them. But uh, yeah, English varieties are very um, very unique. I mean, you have uh, a floral and earthy character, um, some berries like uh, blackberry and. Uh, Oh, what's that? What's the other one you make uh, mead out of? Um, yeah, I forget the name black of that. Black berry. currants, maybe. Yeah, black currants. Those things. Yes. Um, yeah, they have some current character. They're, you know, some very interesting um, regional specific characters to English hops. Again, with the German, you have the you have your Hallertau Middlefru and Saas, which is a Czech, you know, European region. Um, a lot of these land race varieties very old, but these often have some spicy, um, by which we mean um, slightly minty, um, herbal, uh, f- slight phenolic, um, as well as floral characters. A lot of a lot of very delicate aromas in these uh, European land race varieties, and then uh, of course then. Go back to the American varieties, um, which tend to be more pine-like um, or citrus-like, and that's your Simcoe and Cascade, Centennial, Chinook, etc. And that's uh, sort of what started the whole IPA craze in the first place, right? Yeah, and, it, and to this day, Cascade continues to be my, one of my favorite hops in a beer, and probably for you too. Yeah. Um, well, uh, we talked a little about the bitterness ratio and those kinds of things, but with the popularity of whirlpool and dry hopping, uh, you know, using in some cases, huge quantities of of hops to do that, um, really the bitterness number doesn't always tell the whole story anymore. How do you, how do you go about achieving, uh, uh, the correct balance in something that is, uh, using a large amount of dry hops or a large amount of whirlpool hops? Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's... That's a good question because a lot of it comes down to experience, you know, with brewing with and doing the hop additions and tasting how the beer turns out. I think as as a recommendation or as a guideline, um, if you consider it kind of a, a trade-off where if you do the 60-minute addition, you're getting all the bitterness from the hop and none of the aroma. If the, the the later in the boil you add the hop, you're losing bitterness and gaining oil retention uh, and a, and a flavor and aroma um, addition. Your that percentage is increasing. Um, although even short boil times will volatilize a lot of your oil and which is a lot of your flavor. Yeah, aroma. a lot of the a lot of the hop oils are are very. Uh, I, I think uh, Stan Hieronymus has a chart that shows exactly. that most of them boil off in ten or fifteen minutes. I think it is. Exactly. So, yeah, really, if you're if you're trying to target aroma and flavor, uh, do these hop additions after the boil. What we call the a whirlpool addition or a dry hop addition. Whirlpool additions are after you've turned off the kettle, turned off the heat, and the wort is just sitting there hot. It's a hot steep of the hops. Um, you will, you know, depending on the temperature of the, of the wort, you'll still lose some oil to volatilization, but not as much. Um, and then after after fermentation, um, then you can dry hop, you know, and get cool temperatures and main, uh, retain more aroma. But of course, recognize that there's different character to each type of addition. Um, well, and each each of the oils has a different character. So some of them are still yeah. some of them do better in a in a in a in a whirlpool hop uh, area, and then some of them do better in dry hopping. Actually, very good yeah. point. Yeah. yeah, and as Stan points out, I mean, there's something like 500 or more different compounds that have been isolated so far yeah. in hop oil. I mean, there's it is it is really too large a number to put a uh, any single recommendation on or you know so try 
try some uh, different whirlpool hoppings, try some dry hoppings, and see what you get. Yeah, like yeah. I say, a lot of it's experience. But but keep in mind that trade off, that general trade off of, um, you know, boiling causes isomerization and volatile blow off um, after the boil. Now you're retaining those oils and you're not getting the isomerization that you do during the boil. Right. Um, well, uh, we haven't talked about water yet. And uh, of course, you wrote the, the book on water. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah. so I thought maybe you could give us a couple tips uh, on managing your water. Sure. Um, and, and, I mean, let's start with maybe just the importance of water in, in beer, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Well, you know, water is um, 90%, 99% of the, of the weight of the beer. Um, the thing to understand about water is that uh, it is um, a vital part of the seasoning of the beer. And by this, I'm talking about the the, the ion composition, the, the ion profile in the water, your calcium, magnesium, alkalinity, sulfate, chloride, and sodium. You know, all of these ions play a role in determining um, the, the character of the beer. Number one is the effect that your water and uh, has on the pH of the wort and of the beer. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying not to go too deep into the chemistry, but um, pH is the first first uh, factor. Um, I, and I think about, main, mainly you're worried about the pH of the mash as opposed to the finished beer, right? Well, both actually. Both, yeah. okay. If yeah, if, you know, for an all grain brewer, yeah, you are very concerned about the the pH of the mash because that is governing the uh, conversion of your starches to sugars, and it really sets up the chemistry for the rest of the brewing process. So that yeah, that is the, the primary concern. Um, but also, you're interested in mash pH because mash pH affects wort pH, wort pH affects beer pH, and beer pH affects how those beer flavors are expressed to your palate. If the pH is too low, then flavors become kind of focused and one-dimensional. If the pH is too high, these flavors broaden, but they can broaden into a shallow puddle and you really don't taste anything. Um, so, you know, the sweet spot is where you get um, both a sensation of, of brightness of flavor and complexity of flavor. So that's where beer pH is a very important consideration. Um, in conjunction with that, your minerals in the water affect the seasoning aspect of the beer. And typically we're talking about sulfate and chloride. Uh, here, sulfate accentuates the hop character, makes that hop character a little bit more assertive in the beer, a little bit drier. The uh, chloride accentuates the malt character of the beer and makes that a little, little rounder, fuller, and sweeter, just like table salt does food. I mean, it's, it, it's actually the same thing. When, you, when you're talking about salts in, in water and salts in beer, it's the same thing as salts on your food. It is seasoning. The third aspect is the um, the total amount of ions or the total amount of seasoning that you're adding to the, the water and the beer. And so um, at low mineral levels, you have softer flavors. At high mineral levels, you have more robust flavors. Um, and all of this becomes more or less apparent depending on what style of beer you're talking about, if it's a delicate beer versus a very robust tasting beer. So, yeah, this is – water is a complex subject to talk about, um, but the best advice I can give people is to think about it in terms of when you're cooking, you know, food because it ha it, it is the same thing. So, I mean, you're, uh, but we're still concerned about this all the way through, right? So you want to make sure you're yeah. using the right water up front. You're managing your pH as you go, right? And, um, yeah. and sort of, you know, sort of permeates the whole brewing process, right? Yeah, yeah. It's very easy to get wrapped up in talking <laughs> about, you know, specific water profiles for different cities, um, specific ro water profiles for, you know, particular style, um, Example, Irish stout and Dublin water. Everybody says, okay, to brew the best Irish stout, I need to 
match the Dublin water. And that's generally true, but not specifically true. Um, you can achieve a very good Irish stout just by understanding the kind of water that Dublin had that promoted that style. And then in general, that is a high alkalinity water with um, some balancing hardness and such that the mash pH came out right. And that there was um, some sulfate and, and, and chloride in equal proportions. So you had a kind of a balanced malty hoppy uh, character to the beer, not, not a super dry sulfate character, not a super sweet round chloride character to the beer. It was more balanced. Um, so in general, that is how you should look at water. You know, how is this water helping me achieve the, the, the beer flavor that I want? First priority, mash pH. Second priority, uh, the malt flavor balance, the malt hop flavor balance, malty to uh, hoppy. And third, the total amount of seasoning. Am I looking for softer flavors like in a Kolsch or Munich Helles, or am I looking for more robust flavors such as an American Pale Ale or a Imperial Stout or, you know, what have you? Um and I, in How to Brew, I, ha I talk about um, what I call the brew cube. If mm -hmm. you picture a Rubik's cube, you know, um, residual alkalinity corresponds to your beer color, uh, pale, amber, or dark. Um, you, whether you want low residual alkalinity for your pale, zero out residual alkalinity for your amber, uh, high residual alkalinity for your dark beers, then... Um, that uh, beer flavor balance. Now you're looking at your sulfate to chloride ratio and for your um, mineral structure, that um, soft, medium, or firm mineral structure, looking at your uh, calcium concentration, 50, 100, 150 as a guideline. Okay, well, we've covered uh, in some detail the first three ingredients, but of course, we haven't talked about yeast yet. Uh, can right. you give us some advice on selecting the right yeast and, of course, managing your yeast during the brewing process? Sure. Um, yeah, yeast and fermentation are the most important uh, parts of the brewing process. Um, you, can, you can brew a good beer with a bad recipe if you have a good fermentation. You will you will brew a bad beer uh, from a great recipe with a bad fermentation. Um, fermentation is key. So, if you think in uh, engineering parlance of you know faster, better, or cheaper, for fermentation you always want better. You don't want faster. You don't want cheaper. You want better. So this means you know pitching enough yeast. And uh, we can talk about pitching rates in a minute. It means uh, fermenting that beer at the right in the right conditions, uh, the right fermentation temperature um, and consistency, and having um, you know good aeration of your wort. You know all the all the factors that feed into a good good fermentation. You want to have those locked in. And um, uh, before we dive into the details of the brewing process, perhaps also talk about uh, how you select the yeast. What, what, how do you go about uh, picking the right yeast for a particular beer? Yeah. Um, well, ale and lager, certainly, you know, uh, looking at your, the style you're trying to brew. Uh, don't try to brew uh, a award-winning lager with an ale yeast and vice versa. Um, you know, so pick a, pick a yeast that's a, appropriate to the style. Um, from there, you know, you, you, you look at the origin of that strain. So if you're going to brew a German lager, use a German lager yeast. You could use a Czech lager yeast, but that really makes more of a Czech lager flavor profile. Um, you could also use a California common yeast, which is technically a lager yeast. Um, but you're not going to get quite the same character uh, from that yeast, if you're trying to brew a German pills 
versus a California common. So, you know, think about uh, those, those uh, definitions uh, when you're selecting your yeast. Um, from there, I, all I can recommend is, you know, look at the manufacturer's website, look at their choices, look at the fermentation temperature ranges, um, and look at the descriptions of yeast, each yeast to see if there's something in that description that appeals to you or doesn't appeal to you. Um, for example, um, some lager yeast throw more sulfur into the beer than others. If you if you like sulfur or don't like sulfur, that that may be a consideration. Um, other yeasts, uh, for example, uh, ale yeasts. Um, they can be highly flocculent or low flock or you know lower flocculation, um, drier, maltier. Um, again, look at those descriptions and think about what kind of character you're looking for in that final beer, and choose a yeast strain that seems to uh, support that. And of course, uh, occasionally it is okay to go off style with your yeast too, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, this is this is brewing as a hobby after all. So, you know, uh, don't be afraid to experiment, but, you know, understand what you're experimenting with. And, uh, yeah, have fun with it. Yeah, I'm always amazed. Uh, you, you've been with me, I think, to Chris White's. Uh, Chris White oh, yeah. runs White Labs, and has, they have a small brewery as well. And um, what's interesting is you can taste. Um, they'll make a single wort, oh, yeah. and then they will run it through with four four different yeasts maybe. And yeah. you can taste them all in a sampler tray, and they all taste vastly different, don't they? They do. It's, it's really amazing to see the the difference that yeast strain can make. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's yeast selection is definitely one of the more interesting things to play with. Very popular uh, experiment with homebrewing clubs is, you know, to brew a very large batch of wort and then split it up among the members, and everybody pitch a different yeast to it and see what you get. Um, taste those differences. Um, again, going back to first principles, you know, ferment better. You know, uh, when whenever you look at yeast selection and fermentation, make sure that you're pitching enough yeast to do the job, that that yeast is in good health, and that you have supported that yeast with sufficient wort aeration and temperature control. And then you'll have a good beer. And then uh, the final piece of uh, beer recipe design is is perhaps, you know, selecting the right carbonation level, how you package and present your beer. Yeah. Um, I have to I have to confess here that I usually don't pay a whole lot of attention to this aspect of the brewing process. Um, for me, I keg my home brews and I will force carbonate to the same general carbonation level every time i'm whatever I'm, you have I'm, whatever you have the fridge set to right yeah exactly it's I mean, i'm not too particular there but um you know if you are trying to imitate a particular style um brew to a particular style then you know pay attention to how much carbonation that style should have um british mild low carbonation um german hefeweizen high carbonation um, you know, IPAs or, you know, somewhere in the middle. Um, and you can do that either by selecting the amount of priming sugar that you're adding to the beer um, or by, a you know, setting your regulator pressure on your, uh, on your keg. Um, and there are tables in How to Brew and in Beersmith that will help you uh, dial that in, whether it's priming sugar or regulator pressure. And then, of course, presentation of your beer is actually very important. I, I've talked about this. Yeah. I think we've talked about this in other episodes. But yeah, yeah even simple things like the, the the glass that you serve it in makes a big difference. Yeah, um, you know, if 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 it's an aroma heavy style like IPA, you know, having a glass that helps concentrate that aroma. Some of the, I mean, um, some of these uh, new IPA glasses where the the shape of the glass comes up um, helps focus those aroma. And adds to the drinking experience. Um, not every beer should be served in this in the standard uh, conical pint glass, um, shaker glass they're called. Um, some of the maltier styles also benefit from that uh, narrowing of the opening of the, of the of the glass to help you know gather those malt aromas for you. So yeah, I like. I, I'm actually my favorite is probably a tulip style glass, I guess, uh, which looks yeah. a little bit more like a wine glass, really. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on the beer. Yeah. Okay, John. Well, um, we're, we're running a little low on time, but uh, maybe a minute or two about your closing thoughts on beer recipe design and maybe some tips that might help folks uh, uh, sure. design a better recipe. Yeah. I mean, have fun, but keep it real. You know, think about recipe proportions. Um, think about, you know, uh, what... Yeah, I guess, you know, what what you're trying to achieve with your recipe. Um, are you trying to, you generally trying to achieve a very drinkable and balanced beer. So, you know, exercise some restraint with your malt selections, with your hop selections. Um, you know, variety is well and good. Um, but, you know, if you do too much, you may um, create a muddle that you can't separate. So, um I think smash brewing uh, is a is one topic we didn't discuss, and that single malt single. Sure, hop. yeah. Talk about that for just a minute. Yeah, um, that's a great way. You know, it, to you brew a beer with a single malt, like a base malt, and a single hop, Cascade or Mandarina Bavaria or what have you, and you know that's a great way to learn what the signature flavors of these ingredients are. Um, you can, and you can also do that with yeast selection too. Brewing a very simple uh, Pilsner style beer if you, as you're evaluating different um, lager yeast strains. Um, you know, trying to isolate what those different uh, nuances uh, of flavor are. Um, it's a great learning tool, but it's often not a very interesting beer. So, uh, you know, as you look at general recipe design um you can use smash brewing to help you understand what an ingredient tastes like but then go back to the sandwich model if you will and recipe proportions where mostly base malt uh one or two signature malts that you know that cover the signature flavors of that style and then maybe one or two uh, accent malts to add a little bit of uh, extra character. Um, same with your hop hop bills. You know, primary bittering hop, um, then two, maybe three uh, hop varieties for aroma and flavor additions, whether in the whirlpool or dry hopping. Again, select hop varieties that you know are different from one another. Do you know an herbal floral type hop for the, you know, for the main hop, and then maybe add an accent hop that has some more tropical fruit character, or uh, one that has some uh, pine or herbal character. You know, depending on what flavors you like. Well, thank you, John. Uh, really appreciate you being here. I wanted to mention uh, before we go, uh, of course, your website, howtobrew.com, right? Thank you. Yes. Yeah. And uh, the Brew Your Own event, which is coming up in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, in uh, in. March. Uh, March. March. It's only a little over a month away. Um, yeah. Uh, we're both going to be there. We're both teaching full day classes, and there's still time to sign up if you want at the uh, Brew Your Own website, right? That's right. Yeah. I encourage everybody that wants to get a chance to meet and talk with us. Um, you know, we'll be there all day, and uh, we love talking beer just like you do. So. Come yeah, on I'm up. teaching an all day session on uh, beer recipe design. Uh, you're teaching uh, which you and John, I think John Blickman, yeah, right? We're, yeah, we're doing um, all grain brewing essentials uh, the first on Friday, and then I'm doing a, a water in depth water class on Saturday, uh, walking you through um, different water profiles. Uh, we're going to do some mini mashes. We're going to do some water tasting and mash tasting and uh, pH measurements and such. You know, really kind of digging into water. Nice. Yeah. So uh, you can find that at the Brew Your Own website if you're interested in signing up, joining us there. Um, we're, the nice thing about these things is they're, they're, they're fairly intimate classes. I think they limit it to yeah. 35 people and uh, we teach all day. So uh, you, you do get to know the folks in the class. It's a nice, nice experience. Uh, great opportunity to ask questions and learn more. So, um, yeah. Well, thank you again, John. Appreciate you being on the show. My pleasure, Brad. Always good to be here. Again, uh, my guest today was uh, the one and only John Palmer, author of How to Brew at uh, howtobrew.com, as well as The Water Book and Brewing Classic Styles. Thanks again, John. Thank you. A big thank you to John Palmer for joining me this week. 
Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're currently offering 20% off their all-access subscription pass with access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith to get your all-access pass today. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com slash beersmith. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the Riptide Pump, Designed for home brewers, this pump feature features a whisper quiet sealed housing, removable tri clamp stainless steel head, and a built in relief valve for easy priming. Get the Riptide Pump today, another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And Beersmith 3 is available for download for both desktop and mobile platforms. Beersmith 3 adds mead, wine, and cider support, new whirlpool hop options, support for high altitude brewing, and a whole lot more. Check out Beersmith 3 and get your free 21-day trial today from Beersmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. 